Hello and welcome to this video from Winterbourne House and Garden. As you can see the gardens despite lockdown are looking absolutely fantastic at the moment. My name's Dan Cartwright and I'm the head gardener here at Winterbourne House and Garden and I'd like to show you a tiny short glimpse of the garden as it is today as well as answer some of your gardening questions along the way. Thank you to all of our alumni community for sending in your garden related questions in advance. As you can imagine in the garden at this time of year we'd usually be extremely busy um, with lots and lots of uh, cutting material being taken on, taken potting on, um, lots and lots of watering, lots of feeding, lots of deadheading, lots of staking in our herbaceous borders and of course at this time of year we'd be mowing the lawns regularly on a weekly basis and actually that's one of the primary things that's come through from your questions that you've sent through to me in advance is that you're really concerned about how to care for your lawns how to properly feed and weed your lawns and what's the correct process for mowing them so if you'd like to follow me now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. So this is actually one of our formal lawn areas. This is what they call the scree garden or the scree lawn. And this was actually designed by Winterbourne's third and final private owner, John McDonald Nicholson. John McDonald Nicholson bequeathed the house and garden to the University of Birmingham in 1944. And in addition, he was a really enthusiastic grower of alpine plants. And this is one of the areas of the garden that he just designed in order to show off his alpine collection. Surrounding, of course, you have this lovely lush green lawn. And as I say, that's one of the things that's really come through from your questions, uh, that there's a lot of confusion from people about what they should be doing with their lawns at this time of year. One question that I've had um, is how often should I be, growing my, uh, should I be mowing my lawn? Um, really the mowing season is the growing season um, so as long as your lawn is growing as long as it's not too wet or as long as it's not too cold i.e. temperatures drop below freezing point you should really be mowing your lawn historically in the UK the mowing season has been considered to be from March to October perhaps very early November but as winters become milder and milder and milder as time progresses, what we're finding is that lawns continue growing almost right the way throughout the year. And it's not actually unusual for us to be mowing our lawns as early as February and as late as mid-November. Another question that I've had um, is how high or how low should I be cutting my lawn? Um, and that's really down to the individual gardener to decide. There's no set rule, but there are some general pointers to consider. When you first cut your lawn at the very beginning of the year, um, if you cut your lawn too low and too quickly, you'll damage it. So it's a good idea when you do what we call the first cut to start on one of the highest settings. Most domestic lawn mowers like this one that I've got on my left hand side We'll have a very simple mechanism, usually a lever for adjusting the height. And I don't know if you can see that on this one, but as you pull the lever up, the height of the mower drops and vice versa. As I say, how low you mow your lawn is really uh, down to personal preference. For an ordinary ornamental lawn, the recommendation is to go no lower than between 0.5 and 1 inch. And in fact, mowing your lawn too low can have a detrimental impact. One of the problems that can occur if you mow your lawn too frequently on too low a setting 
is that you can allow weeds to colonise your lawn area. And that's another area that I see coming through the questions that we've received, that lots of people are concerned about weeds in their lawns and how to eradicate them. So let's address that now. Really, with weeds in your lawn, you've got a three-pronged approach that I would recommend, and not all three aspects may be necessary, depending on the severity of the problem. Common lawn weeds, of course, include dandelions, daisies, buttercups, uh, and plantains. The first point of attack that I'd recommend is seeding your lawn. If you've got strong, healthy grass in the first instance, you're far less likely to have a weed problem. The second thing I'd do if I've got a problem with weeds in my lawn is I, was, I would identify where there are large rosette forming weeds such as plantains or dandelions and these can simply be removed by hand. So here I've got a couple of implements that here at Winterbourne we'd call these dandelion grubbers but they've got various names and they come in various different shapes and sizes but you can see both have a very long narrow blade and that means you can dig down really deep into the turf um, and really get hold of some of those long tap roots that you often get on for example dandelions but as I say it's a very narrow blade so you can do so without gouging out huge lumps of turf and leaving big gaps behind in your lawn as you go so that would be my second prong of attack. And then finally, if you're still suffering from um, a real weed problem in your lawns, the third and final thing you should consider, but really only as a last resort, um, is, so, is applying some kind of selective weed killer. And these are readily available from all sort of garden centres and DIY, DIY stores. And what they do, they're called selective weed killers. Uh, they kill the broadleaf weeds only uh, and leave the grass untouched and unharmed. But what I would ask you to consider is, unless you're trying to grow a bowling green or something like this, is whether a weedy lawn is really a very significant problem. Do consider the environmental benefits, they're great for pollinators of course, of growing your lawn slightly longer and allowing some species to come into flower. Okay, so another thing that's really come through in your questions um, that I've been sent beforehand is that you're struggling a little bit with what you should be doing with your veggies at this time of year. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to follow me into our vegetable garden and we're gonna have a look at some potatoes first and then some leeks, follow me. So we've had a couple of veggie related questions and I think we can probably answer several, several of them all in one go really. Um, primarily people are concerned about timings uh, and particularly about missing or being hit by frosts. So we've got one question concerning potato crops um, and one of our alumni community has planted their potatoes in March, which is exactly the right thing to do. Um, because it's been so mild, the potatoes have grown with abandon, and then we've had a cold snap and the tops have been hit by frost. And that's quite a common story, really, with our sort of variable and unpredictable weather these days. And um, it's difficult for me to say exactly without seeing the potato crop in person, but my instinct is that you'll probably more than likely be fine. Um, the critical thing is that the tubers beneath ground remain unfrozen. If the tubers become frozen, then you're in trouble and you'll likely lose your entire crop. Um, but given that it was a light frost that hit the tops, I suspect it was also a very light frost, in which case the damage is probably quite superficial. 
on frost damage growth and I've bought it's not a potato but I've bought this um, ricinus plant out for you to have a look at this has also experienced some frost damage this was actually under glass believe it or not in one of our greenhouses uh, in our nursery area which I'll show you in a moment um, but it, in the middle of May it still dropped cold enough one night for some damage to occur so that just demonstrates how unpredictable our weather can be and how difficult it can can be to grow some of these things without without fault um, but that's an example of what frost damage might look like and I think that's probably what's showing on some of the foliage on your potatoes and if it is this is really just superficial and you can see on this ricinus plant here that the rest of the plant is really quite healthy and we've got good new growth at the center which is untouched and these scorched leaves these damaged leaves here are simply going to die off or i might remove them myself with secateurs and this healthy new growth is going to grow back from the center as i say i suspect there's something similar happening with your potatoes so i wouldn't be too concerned if you do get whole branches of foliage which have been damaged perhaps they're completely blackened and collapsed then again i would cut those off myself with secateurs they're no longer photosynthesizing, they're not going to do the plant any good. And the second sort of related question was really about butternut squash and generally when, when you're able to plant out slightly tender vegetables or very soft leaf plants. And again, a bit like we're saying with the height of your mowing, uh, when you're mowing on a weekly basis, there's a, there's a kind of judgment call for the individual gardener to make for themselves there. Um, of course the answer to that question will be very seasonally dependent so it very much depends on how the season's playing out but it also depends on where you are in the country or in fact where you are in the world of course if you live in the south of UK you like of the UK you're likely to be a couple of weeks in advance of us here in Birmingham and you're likely to experience higher temperatures much sooner so there's got to be an element of judgment from the individual gardener themselves there. But as a rule of thumb, I would say that soft leaf plants or half hardies or annuals that you're growing in your greenhouses or tender vegetables for planting out in your vegetable beds should be planted out by the last week of May or the first week of June, in general at the latest. If you've not got them planted out in early June, then you're probably getting too far behind yourself. Very, very unlikely that we're going to have any dramatic drops in temperature um, from the first week of June onwards. Um, and even in the middle of May, it's quite unusual these days. So the third and final question related to veggies um, was about leeks and, and one of our particular alumni community um, was particularly concerned about their leek plants that they germinated and were sitting there and, and looked like blades of grass and weren't really growing as much as they'd anticipated. So I'm just going to walk you over to our patch of leeks now. This is our leek crop here, as you can see, quite a bit larger um, than the leeks that you've described to me. But again, a bit like your, your frosted potato tops from the description that you've given me, I really wouldn't be too concerned. Our leeks are much, much larger, but we germinated ours under glass uh, as early as February. So we'd have a slightly more advanced crop and that's the reason why they're much, much bigger. And barring these odd, unexpected cold snaps, so far it has been a very mild season and actually quite good growing weather. So I'm not surprised that these are as advanced as they are. I think the critical thing with your leeks is to get them in the ground as soon as they're big enough. So you'd be looking for something that's about three quarters of the diameter of a pencil, say. And as soon as they reach that size, get them in the ground um, get some slow-release fertiliser around them, something like a grow more or a bone meal, 
um, and give them a drink regularly because if we're experiencing dry weather as we are today and extremely high temperatures they're going to take as much water as you can give them. The second critical thing to think about is don't be afraid to harvest your leeks even if they are very very small. Leeks have a very long season and in other people's gardens and on allotments you'll often find people with leeks still in the ground even when there's snow on the ground right the way throughout into the winter. So you don't want to leave it too long before you start harvesting because what you'll end up with is a huge glut of leeks all at the end of the year. Much better to harvest some while they're still young uh, and allow the others to mature slightly larger. The other quick tip I can give you before we move on is it's sometimes a good idea just to gently earth some dry earth up along the stem of the leek plants and this is called blanching and that means you'll get you'll exclude light from the base of the plant and you'll get a much longer white section which of course is much, has a much greater edible value so that's a good tip that you can carry on when they are large enough to plant out into the garden okay so what we're going to do now is i'm going to take you to the bit that people don't usually see and i'm going to take you to what i call our back of house area um, or our behind the scenes nursery area and we've got a couple of questions about propagation which it would be useful for me to discuss there so follow me it's quite a walk but do have a good look around the walled garden as we go because it's looking particularly nice at the moment This is actually our Edwardian walled garden and um, so in the Edwardian period when the Nettlefolds first built Winterbourne House and Garden this entire area would have been used exclusively for vegetable production. Now as you can see we just use a small section uh, to demonstrate the growing of vegetables and the rest of the walled garden is planted with mixed herbaceous perennials and roses. As you can imagine, this lockdown period has been extremely challenging for all of us, including the garden team at, at Winterbourne House and Garden. On a usual day, we'd have a team of about six or seven professional garden staff working alongside a small army of garden volunteers, maintaining and looking after the beautiful gardens. At the moment, we're working on um, a skeleton staff only, um, with one member of the garden team coming in per day um, to look after primarily our glasshouse collections. So carrying out essential work only on our glasshouse collections, which would simply die without the daily input of one member of the garden team each day. So as you can imagine, extremely challenging, and I'm sure you've seen as you've been having a look around the walled garden for yourself, uh, lots and lots of lawn mowing for us to do when we're back, lots of edging of lawns and lots of weeding. But one thing that's been really uh, buoying for us all to um, observe as we go through this lockdown period is as with yourselves, how many people are turning to their own back gardens for some kind of solace or exercise during this lockdown period. And I think that will stand gardens like ours uh, and the, the garden community nationally in good stead as we move forward, as we sort of incubate a new generation of garden enthusiasts through this period.
So this is the behind the scenes bit. So this is the bit that the general public don't normally get to see. Uh, and this is just the small part of our large nursery area or our working glass houses. And these glass houses service, if you like, all of the beautiful display glass houses you see in the public areas of the garden. So here we grow hundreds, if not thousands of plants uh, for use in the garden over the next 12 months. But the reason I wanted to bring you here um, was it because it's a useful place for me to answer a couple of questions um, regarding propagation. So the first thing that you've asked me um, is how to take um, softwood cuttings in spring and early summer. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate that to you here on this pentamen plant that I've just grabbed from over there. Um, softwood cuttings are really probably one of the easiest to take. Um, as I say, spring or early summer is the right time to do it. Um, and you're looking for the very soft new growth at the top of many plants, usually herbaceous perennials, um, but appropriate for many, many shrubs as well. Um, but it's not appropriate for everything, so you do have to do a bit of digging around to find out if you're doing it with the right thing or not. So as I say, this is a penstemon. We're looking for very soft, young, new growth. As I say, we call these softwood cuttings. And you're looking for something about five to 10 centimetres long. And the critical piece of information to impart to you in the first instance is you need to cut just below a leaf node because that's where all the hormones form that are going to form the roots as your cutting progresses. So essentially that's your softwood cut in there. As I say, about five to 10 centimetres long. Um, if you start to get um, some woody material forming at the base of that range, five to 10 centimetres, that's generally what we call a semi-ripe cutting. And those are better taken slightly later in the season. Next thing you want to do is strip away the lower leaves because these leaves are full of water and now we've cut this from its mother plant, it's going to lose an awful lot of water, it's going to transpire. So we lose those lower leaves and what we're really interested in um, is the side shoots that are going to grow um, from the side of the stem. If you've got a very, very large leaf plant, like a pelagonium, a scented pelagonium or something like this, the two or so leaves that you leave at the top of the cutting, you may even want to cut those in half to reduce transpiration further. And you may even want to take out the growing point of the cutting. But as our penstemon's relatively small in leaf, I don't think that's going to be an issue in this instance. So you take several of these, uh, and then you need to pop them up. If you can't pop them up for a while, um, then really what you need to do is place them in a polythene bag to keep them fresh, or put them in the fridge if you can't come back to them for several hours. I'm gonna pot ours into um, just multi-purpose compost, which is peat-free multi-purpose compost. Um, but you may want to mix in something like horticultural grit or perlite to add a little bit of extra drainage because while your cutting hasn't got any roots it's going to be very susceptible to rotting off but I think for our penstemon multi-purpose compost is going to be absolutely fine make yourself a hole with a dibber and you're looking to bury between half and two thirds of the cutting and where I'm doing this in the nursery area for real, I'd probably take about half a dozen cuttings and put them around the outer edge of a nine centimetre pot. Pop that somewhere warm, a windowsill is ideal at this time of year, um, or you can even tie a, poly a clear polythene bag with an elastic band over the top to keep some extra humidity and some moisture in there. But if not, keep it evenly moist, not too wet, but the surface of the soil should be evenly moist. And I'd anticipate with something like a penstemon, within two to four weeks, you'd have roots showing. Once the roots show, take them out of the pot, break them apart and pot them individually. The second question has been about how do we divide plants and specifically how do we divide herbaceous perennials? 
and I'm going to whiz through this one because we're a little bit short for time and I'm going to use this Achillea as an example. Dividing perennials is really, really simple and it's a great way to multiply the number of plants in your garden. You'll more than likely be doing this with herbaceous perennials that are growing in your borders. But I'm going to, for ease, I'm going to do it with this Achillea that we've got growing in a pot. All you need to make a successful division is a herbaceous perennial that grows from multiple points at the base, or what we call a clump forming perennial. And that means when you divide the plants, there are still several growing points there that are going to survive in the new pot or in the new place in the border that will regrow to form new plants. Or to put it another way, something woody or something with a single stem or a single growing point such as this Selenum latiniatum cannot be divided. There are simply no parts of the plant which can be divided into two. So the easiest way to make a division is to get two forks. I'm going to use hand forks here but if you're in your own garden and you have herbaceous border at home, you might want to use ordinary garden forks and put them straight into the middle of the plant and start to tease the plant apart. And this might seem quite brutal, but in actual fact, there's nothing to be concerned about at all. As long as you've got a good growing point showing at the top and a good root system showing at the base, and you could actually divide that Achillea into three or four more plants, even with a plant that, of that size. I would pop those into individual pots. Again, keep them somewhere not too cold for a couple of weeks and keep them evenly moist. And they'll soon root down into their new compost and form new plants. That's all we've got time for today, I'm afraid, folks. But I couldn't possibly let you go without first having a good long walk all the way down our pergola. I hope you've enjoyed having a good look around the garden with me today. If I haven't had time to answer one of your questions, don't worry. I'll be hosting a live Q&A on Winterbourne House and Garden's Facebook page until 2.30pm this afternoon. So head over to there now and I'll get cracking answering some more questions. Thank you.